you think of when you think of the word stewardship? Do you think of saving the rainforest? Do you think of going into debt to build a building for millions of dollars with a capital campaign? Is this really the depth of our understanding and our culture of stewardship? God's Word is really clear on what stewardship is and really what it isn't. It is about God owning it all. And if you don't own it, then you realize you're just a manager. God owns it all. When we get that, it changes us. It changes how we serve. It changes how we give. It changes how we spend our time, how we use our passions, how we approach our health, how we view our relationships. And it changes how we handle our money. It changes our legacy. It changes us when we realize we're managing it all for the glory of God. This is Real Stewardship. Well, I don't know about you, um, but uh, maybe just by a show of hands, who here grew up like I did, not rich? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Now, I wouldn't say my family was was poor. We weren't. Um, Precious Precious even got on me uh, the other day when I was sharing this with her because her family really struggled, and I can't say we ever really did. My, My mom and dad really were just very, I'd say, creative in the ways that they found to save money. Um, one, one of those ways that I can remember when, uh, when my dad had five of us kids in the house is he would buy whole milk and then he would, he would take the empty jug and pour half of the gallon into that empty jug and then he'd take it under the sink and fill it up with water, both jugs. Okay, you know what we called that? No, white water. <laughs> It wasn't even skim, okay? It doesn't even deserve that title, all right? Um, You know, and another thing that my parents did when it came to um, being creative and saving money was uh, with with shoes, okay? If uh, if you ever saw me as a kid, I probably look like a duck because um, my dad always bought us shoes that were like five sizes too big, okay? And it wasn't just shoes. It was like a baseball glove. I still have my baseball glove since I was in seventh grade. Okay, and I used it. I've been using it still. Okay, it's because it was that big, but that, that's what they did. You know, another thing that they did is they bought groceries in bulk as well. Um, how many of you guys ha- like margarine in your house? Use margarine, just a, just just a couple. Okay, just a few. Okay, um, I I I was telling Wayne. I, he reminded me of it uh, just the other day that uh, margarine is only one molecule away from plastic. <laughs> okay. Now, I did a little research, Wayne, and that is true, but just because it's one molecule away doesn't mean it's close to plastic, okay? If you're, if you're into that kind of stuff, you'll know, okay, it's not actually that big of a deal. But my parents, they bought margarine by the five-gallon bucket, okay? So every time we had to fill up the butter dish, my mom would go down to the freezer where she kept it and with an ice cream scoop, and she scooped out all the margarine that we needed for the week. <laughs> that was just something they did to save money. Um, I won't forget this one either. My parents, they had friends who were buffalo farmers, or you might call them bison, um, and uh, they, were, they were real close to us. And so one time they were butchering one of their bison, and they offered the heart, the, uh, the tongue, and the liver to, to my parents. They just said, hey, if you want it, you can have it. You know, it's just there for the taking. Well, the heart actually tasted pretty good. But then my mom got the bright idea to grind up the liver and to turn it into, uh, sp- to put it in her spaghetti sauce. Okay. Mmm, yeah, yum. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was not pleasant. Okay. But then worse, she decided since it tasted so bad, she might mix it with some ground chuck to make it, maybe that would bring the flavor back and make it taste good. Well, no, she ended up prolonging our suffering for another week of spaghetti leftovers. And uh, that, that's how bad it was. Now, my, my mom and dad, even though I was kind of knocking them a little bit, we do the same kind of thing in our house. I mean, if my, my kids were to tell stories, we'd kind of do the same thing. But they did teach us some really good lessons, though. And um, one thing that uh, I, I recognize that my dad taught myself and my brother was a good work ethic that uh, when we were young he said he said to to my brother Tim and I it's time to time to get a job and time to start making some money 
And uh, so we had some, some family friends that were aging that didn't, didn't want to mow their lawns anymore. And, and so we took over mowing, mowing lawns. We had uh, three or four different lawns that we mowed for regularly during the summer. And uh, I can remember that first time that I had to mow a lawn. And I was so short that those handlebars for the lawnmower were like up here. And like I, I, couldn't, I couldn't hardly push it up the hills because it was just like the, the thing was too heavy, okay? But uh, that was a job that actually we kept all throughout high school and college, and it was just a great source of income for us. In the winter, then we also took over shoveling snow. And I don't know if it was because I was short as a kid, but I can remember snow banks over my head. I mean, that's just the way it was in Canada, and, I, and I, know, I know it's still like that, okay? It's ridiculous sometimes up there. But, you know, the best thing that would happen when we would finish up with mowing the lawn or shoveling the snow, we would we'd go to the door and knock on it, and all of a sudden the, the old lady or an old man would, would come to the door, and they'd have something in their hand. It was this. It was money. And they, they handed it to us, and, and they said, here you go. Thank you for, for the good work. And we took it for ourselves, and, and that was our first experience with earning something of our own. It's something I'll, I'll never forget. We worked for something. We owned something. We could choose what to do with it. It was ours. It was our money. And uh, that was really, really exciting for us as, as kids, that we could go and buy the Lego sets that we wanted to. Or I even got into snowboarding and um, hockey and some other hobbies that I could I could just go and buy my own stuff for, and, and it was really, really fun to do that. And, you know, that, that's a, a mindset that I was, that I carried with me all, I mean, even till now is something that, that I even have. It's like, I earned it, I own it, I can choose what to do with it, this is awesome, okay? But you know what I realized after buying our first car when Precious and I were engaged? Was I was introduced to the fact that we actually don't own what we have, okay? What we have has been given to us by someone, and that is God. Now, the reason I think we struggle with this is because we work for what we have. We work really hard, and so when we do it, we feel the sense of pride, the sense of ownership, and, and we even have pieces of paper that tell us, you own this. We have a title for a car. We've, we've got the deed for our home, or maybe some of us do, okay? Um, we, we've got uh, maybe a, a diploma that says we worked for this degree, our education, it says this is yours. But that's what I want to start with this morning in introducing this series, Real Stewardship, is that we don't own anything. God owns everything. God owns everything. Now, God wouldn't say, no, that's not your car. No, that's not your house. No, he does give give you that, you know, right uh, in, in Scripture to say, yes, this is your property and it's yours to manage right now, okay? But, but essentially what, what I've learned in life is that we're just transferring goods from one person to the other to the other. You watch when someone dies, guess what happens? All their stuff, it doesn't go in the grave with them. It doesn't go up to heaven with them. It gets transferred to somebody else. And so that's what tells me that we are just managing God's blessings and our goal is to do it for his glory. And that, that's basically the foundation of this whole series is we want to manage God's blessings, God's way for God's glory. That's what real stewardship is. And often I think we, we think of stewardship when it comes to money, but it's so much more than that. It's time, it's resources, it's family, and we're going to kind of just get into all that this morning as we begin, okay? So I want you to take your Bibles. If, if you got your Bibles, I want to just bring you to the first book of the Bible, where we see this foundation from Scripture that God owns everything. And if you have your notes in your bulletin, you can fill those out as we go as well. But we're going to begin with this foundation that God owns His creation. God owns His creation. We see this in the first few chapters of the book of Genesis. If we begin in the beginning of the Bible, the first words in Genesis chapter 1, Verse 1 are these. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So if God created it, then who owns it? Him. He owns it. Okay, I think we can agree on that. In chapter 2, though, we see 
what God gave to Adam and to Eve. It says there in Genesis chapter 2 that uh, before the fall, God had given Adam responsibility over the earth to care for it and to steward over it, to manage it. It says this in Genesis chapter 2, 15, that the Lord took man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to and take care of it. And it goes on in verse 28, that God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over everything that moves on the earth. See, what we see right away at the beginning of scripture is that God put Adam in a place of stewardship over what he had created, over the birds, over the fish, over the land, over every animal that lived. His position was a position of manager over what belonged to God. And I think that is really key. And that, that is something that if you can start with that, if you can ingrain that in your life, that what I have is not my own, it belongs to God, and I am simply a steward over it, it's going to change everything. It's going to change the way that you, you live your life. It's going to change the way that you use your money we see that we're stewarding over something that we don't actually own. We want to treat it the way that God would treat it. None of these things belong to Adam, as we can see. It's not so easy for us to see that some of our things don't belong to us. I think it's because it's so, so close to the beginning of, of creation. Now, I kind of ask at the, at the beginning here, why did, why did God put Adam in the position of a manager or a steward over what God had created. And I believe, I believe the answer is this. God desired for Adam to bring him glory and honor by stewarding over what he had created. What's further, I think that, that God gave Adam's life value and meaning, purpose, by giving him work to do. Think about that. You may just view your work as something that's mundane, that you're just like, man, I'm just going to put in my hours so that I can pay the bills. But my goodness, if that's all you're doing, you are really missing out. Because God created work to be something that gives us purpose and value and meaning in this life. See, work happened before the fall. It did. So work is not a part of the fall. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful part of life. And we have the privilege to be able to work. Now, I, I, I don't know if it's just me, but I get bored. If, uh, if I don't have anything to do, I get, I get down, I get depressed, I get, you know, just, you know, in a funk. And it's, it's when I get something to do, when I get a project, when I get, you know, have a goal that I have to achieve, that's when I come alive. And I hope it is for you because that's the way that God designed this life to be, that God gave you purpose in your work. And he, he created work so that you might bring him glory in that, all right? So, at the foundation, we hear God owns his creation. We're a steward over everything he has. But let's get specific, though. Let's get specific. This next point is that God owns us. God owns us. And that's where we're going to spend uh, the most of our time this morning. The Apostle Paul, he said this, and, and we'll use this as, as just a jumping board for where we're going. He said this, For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Every single one of you, every single child of God, whether or not you, you've trusted in him yet, or, or maybe you're, you're just waiting, you've been bought by the blood of Christ. His shed blood on the cross has paid for your sins, took your punishment. You were bought with a price. Now, what does it mean that we were bought? Well, if you've received his gift, it means this. Keep on going. First Corinthians chapter 3, 20, 23 um, through uh, verses 4, verses 1 and 2. It says, and you are Christ's. You are Christ's. Christ is God's. And this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ's and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Wow. So you may think that, that you're just, you know, just a lone ranger Christian and that, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, what, what you do after you receive Christ. It says this, though, you've got a job to do. You are owned by Christ. God owns you. And furthermore, you are a steward of the mysteries of God. That is the gospel. And he says it's required 
that if you're a steward, you be faithful in that. You be faithful. So you belong to Christ. Your life is not your own. You belong to God. And if we can get those two things right, man, God owns everything, and my life is not my own, man, what a way to go through life. What a selfless way to live. And I, I guarantee you, those people that, that you probably look up to, those people in history, they lived that way. Those faithful Christians of old, especially the disciples, the apostles, they lived that way. They knew God owns everything. My life is not my own. I'm here to glorify and serve my God. It's also freeing. There is, there's this aspect of when we own something, we have this anxiety about it breaking or losing it. And, and it's freeing to know if God owns everything, then he's, he's got it. He, he's going to take care of us. It says this in Matthew chapter 6, um, verse 25 through 26. I'll just, this is a long portion of scripture, and it's going to be familiar to, to some of you. But it's this, it's this statement from Jesus just expressing, hey, I own everything. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. You don't have to have anxiety about this life, about what you eat or drink. It says this. This is Jesus talking. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30, but if God so closes, clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we, we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. What, what great words for us to enter a new year into. Man, there's so many things that we could have anxiety or worry about. But we don't have to. God's saying, I own it. I'm in control. I'm your provider. Trust me. Stop worrying. This is something we need to speak over our lives each day, I think. We need to encourage each other in. We belong to him. We belong to him. Specifically, though, when we talk about God owning us, let's get specific. If you got your, your, your notes here, um, let's get specific as to what Scripture says specifically God owns when he says God owns. When it says God owns us, First of all, I, I believe it means that God owns our bodies. God owns our, our bodies. In 1 Corinthians 16, verses 19 through 20, it says this, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You know, our bodies, it says right here, are temples of God the Holy Spirit. He lives in each one of us. If, if you have received Jesus, the Holy Spirit has come. He's indwelling within you. He's empowering you to live the Christian life. And so your body then becomes a dwelling place for God. It used to be in the Old Testament that there was a physical building, a structure where God resided. But in the New Testament, in these days, he sent his Holy Spirit to dwell in each one of us. That is a blessing. But it comes also with a responsibility that we honor our bodies in the way that we use them. Scripture speaks of ways that, that don't honor our bodies. Let me just, just bring up this verse from Galatians. It says this specifically. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. 
I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Wow. Now, the great fact of the gospel is that because of these things, we're condemned. We're sinners. I mean, you, you probably read these. Don't, don't read them from the standpoint that that's out there, okay? That's, that's us. This is us, okay? Let's just be honest, okay? Maybe, maybe uh, you know, except for a, a handful of, of, of the things that, that were just stated in this passage, this is me. This is you. We don't deserve heaven. Okay, we've been bought with a price, the grace of Jesus. And the fact that he's bought us, he's called us his own, he's redeemed us, he's brought us to God, means that our bodies we should treat as temples of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are some things that maybe we don't consider to be uh, sinful, things that we do to our body. Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, lust, maybe, maybe it's addiction sexually, um, maybe it's drinking or smoking, or uh, this is a big one for us, overeating, laziness, uh, jealousy. Um, maybe, maybe it's just simple as not exercising, not taking care of our body. Maybe we've just gotten discouraged. I know how that is. But the fact is, is that God desires that we use our bodies to bring him glory. And when you exercise, it can be an act of worship. You know that? A lot of us, some of us really love to exercise. Use it as an act of worship to God. Maybe um, pushing yourself away from the table or from that party platter at the New Year's, New Year's Eve party, okay, would be an act of, of worship. It is. We're taking care of our body for doing that. Could be that um, going to bed at a decent time could be an act of worship for us. In whatever we're doing, whatever way we're using our body, we're saying, God, I thank you for this temple that you've given me. I want to use it for your glory. Because I don't own this. You own it. You dwell within me. You bought me. And I want to thank you by the way that I use my body. Let's keep on going. Our bodies are stewardship from God. Secondly, our time. Our time is a stewardship from God. We don't think about time very often. You know, maybe we'll check the watch and see, oh, man, it's, he's going a little bit long, or I have things to do today, right? But, uh, man, each one of us, God has given to every single one of us, no matter what we do with our work, no matter how many kids we have, no matter where we are in whatever stage of life, God has given us 60 seconds in each minute, 24 hours in each day, 160 hours in each week, and 52 weeks per year and so forth. We could even say that he's given us 70 to 80 to some of us 90 or 100, 100 years. We've been all given the same amount of time each day, and we are to live it for the glory of God. There's a few verses that teach us this, that tell us that our time is not our own. Psalm 90 verse 12 says this, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our our days. What would that look like in your life? Asking yourself in the weeks and days ahead, man, how can I make the most of these days for the glory of God? Not just for my own glory, not just for the, the furtherance of my own career, but furtherance of God's glory. How can I do that? Hebrews 9, 27 says, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that then comes judgment. Every single one of us will die. Unless the Lord returns, which we pray he does, every single one of us will die. There is a 100% mortality rate. There is. So it's appointed for man to die, and we all will face the judgment of God. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 2 says this, that there is a time to be born, and there is a time to die. Each one of us, we know that we have an appointment with death. That is fixed. It's going to happen and so what we choose to do, how we spend our days, matters. It matters if we want to bring glory to God. And so that's what I want to ask you, is how are we doing with managing our time? If you're like me, there's a lot of distractions around us, namely from this device in my pocket, okay? It's even so bad that Apple, in their latest release, they, um, they decided to start telling you how much time you're using your phone each day, okay? And I think I'm averaging somewhere like three hours a day right now. That's a lot of time. 
Okay, if you think about the, of the, the hours that you're awake, man, staring at a screen, my word, it's crazy. And that's not even counting the computer time that I spend. And I know it's not just me, it's all of us. It's all of us. We waste a lot of time. Social media, internet, maybe shopping, sleep, television habits, whatever it may be, we waste a lot of time. Make this your time a year where you commit, don't waste your time. I'm going to use my time for the glory of God. I want the Lord to say, well done. You've used your time well. Okay? Our time is a stewardship from God. Third, if we're keeping on going here, our possessions are also a stewardship from God. And it uh, says this in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 16, that, O Lord our God, from your hand comes all this abundance that we've that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name. And they say, and all of it belongs to you. All of it belongs to you. Now think about this. I think when we get into this building, into the church, especially about the time when we take up an offering, we, we usually pray, God, help us to be good stewards of this money that we're putting in the plate, right? Our tithe or our offerings. Help us to be good stewards as a church of this money that you've given us, that we might use it for the furtherance of your kingdom and your gospel, and, and may you be glorified in it, okay? And, and we, we call this place God's house, his church, okay? But I think, I think that is just so small-minded because the reality is if we say that God owns everything, guess what? He doesn't just own that money in the offering plate or that money that, that's in the general fund or, or what we plan to you know, spend this year as a church on, on furthering God's kingdom. No, God owns it all. He owns every single dollar in your pocket, every single dollar in your bank account, in your investments, whatever it may be, your cars, your house, your boat, your toys, wherever it is, God owns it all. It's all his. It's all his. And so let's change our thinking in that. It all comes from the hand of God. He's given it to us that we can manage it for his glory. Okay, so our possessions, our body, our time, it all belongs to God. It's the stewardship from him. Let's get that mindset. Got two more. Our families, our families are also a stewardship from God. Aren't our families a blessing, especially this time of year? We realize how, how precious a gift our families are. And there's some words in scripture that, that tell us this about our children. First, it says in Psalm 127.3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a heritage. They're a blessing from God. And that, that is something that sometimes we forget. Let's remember that when we're frustrated with our kids. Those of you that are parents, or maybe you're frustrated with your old adult kids right now. I don't know. But let's just remember, they are a blessing, a stewardship from God. Each one of the children that God has blessed us with, or the grandkids, or the family members that God has put in our family, they are a blessing from God. Let's view them in that. Also, husbands, remember this, Proverbs 18, 22 says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Okay? Your spouse, men, your, your wives are, are a blessing from God. You found a good thing in your wife, okay? Treat her that way. And uh, women, vice versa, okay? Honor, respect your husband. Men, love your wives. So the Bible te teaches us, our families, they are a stewardship from God. They are. And so let's live that way. Let's, let's live in a way that we are going to give an account to God for the way that we stewarded our use of our children, our use of our, our, our marriage, Whatever it may be, let's view God as giving them to us for his purpose, for his glory. All right? Number five, and we're going to close out with this. Because I think it's important that we realize this. Stewardship is not just about money. It's as I said, it's about everything. God owns everything. Using all of our resources to glorify God. But our money specifically is something that God has a lot to say about. And actually next week, we're going to actually just focus right in on that. Because I think it was somewhere around 10% of what Jesus said actually had, had to do with money. Because money is just usually an amplifier, if, if you know what I mean. If we have a little bit of money and we use it in a certain way, guess what we do when we get a lot of money? We use it that, that same way in just bigger ways, okay? 
And so it just, money, money shows us really our heart. If you look at your checkbook and see how you spend your money, I'll, I'll show you what, what you love, what your priorities are, okay? And so our money just shows us where, where our heart is at in regards to our relationship with God. And so just as he's provided us talent and abilities or he's provided us with health and strength or jobs for work, he provides us with money that we might honor him. Now, one thing that I would say is it's, it's easy as Christians to think, well, if I'm giving a tithe, then I'm giving God what he wants, okay? If I'm giving 10% off the top, then I'm, I'm giving to God what, what he expects and so I can use the rest for whatever I want, Okay? But let's just change our thinking in that way again, just as we said with our possessions. God owns it all. God owns it all. And so let's live that way in the way that we use our money. We should always be asking these questions with every dollar of every paycheck. How can I use this money to honor and glorify you, God? How can I be a good manager of what you have given to me? Maybe it's time to take a look at your finances and reprioritize Here's, here's just some basic principles that I've learned from God's word and also from, from life. It says, put God first. Learn to live off of 90%. Learn to live within my means. Save all I can. Make wise investments. And lastly, take advantage of God-sent opportunities. Just some basic things that we've learned in our family. All with the goal that one day we're going to have to give an account. We're going to have to give an account. If you stand before God, will he be pleased? Will he say, well done, you good and faithful servant. You have stewarded what I have given you well. I don't know about you, but I want God to say that about the way that I used my time, my talents, my family, my possessions, and my money. All of those things I want God to be honored with. In conclusion, let's just be reminded this from 1 Corinthians you have been bought with a price. And that's our motivation. The love, the grace of Jesus Christ on our lives. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. See, he owns us because he paid for us with his shed blood on the cross. It says in, in uh, uh, famous hymn, Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Praise the one who paid my debt. Praise him and raise this life up from the grave. Can we thank him today? That's the way we want to end our service. I'm going to pray for us and then I'm going to invite Wayne up and he's going to lead us in a time of communion where we're going to just give God praise and honor and thank him for paying our debt, the debt we owe to him in sin and for going to the cross so faithfully to buy us. We've been bought with a price. Let's pray. God.